conference on the public review draft of ASHRAE 36P. Uh, there will be two that we'll produce. This is Stuart Fisher. Uh, he and I have been working on this together. I'll let him speak mostly. And of course, Dave uh, will be turning in his own comments. He's a little bit more familiar with the system. So in any case, Stuart, far away. We'll go after yeah, like about 15, 15 comments here and just comment on them page by page. Okay. I'd like to thank everybody for giving me the, the opportunity to, to review the stand or the guidelines and to, and to comment, uh, starting on page two in the under um, the paragraph A on heating signal. It has uh, modulating over under the device. It has modulating valve or modulating electric heating coil. Uh, I have a concern with that. I, I put a comment that the electric heating coil should only be used as a last re resort. Um, I've had bad experience with uh, with using heating coils for tempering. Uh, they're great for less expensive first cost, but I've run into experience where they're a, um, a nightmare when it comes to operating costs and, and maintenance costs. And then I have a, a basic concern with the reheat system in general, where we're cooling airstream down and then turning around and reheating it. So that's what I had for page two, page three. Oh, uh, Dave, any comments on that? Okay, good. So on page three is right. Okay, go ahead. Okay, page three under that, uh, the same thing, the heating signal, modulating electric valve. Um, further in, I, I realize that I, I guess in milder climates you can use them where they're only occasionally used. But here in, in Michigan, um, I know one application um, when I worked for Chrysler where they used, they didn't want to install uh, a separate boiling boiler system for reheat. The main heating for the building was done with gas-fired uh, rooftop units. They didn't want to install a separate boiler for hydronic heating coils, so they installed electric. Um, and it was just a, it was an energy nightmare. And a um, maintenance nightmare. So that's all I had for page three. Uh, Dave is shaking his hand. Head, you okay with that, Dave? Yes. Okay. Uh, so we're now on page uh, nine here. Go ahead. Page nine. Yep. Page nine. Um, I just had a, a general concern uh, with the dual duct heating and cooling system. Again, it's along that same guidelines of, of we should avoid as an industry avoid simultaneously heating and cooling at the same time. Makes sense. That's all I had for page 9. Page 14. Going on to page 14. Um, this is regarding the minimum speeds for VFDs and stuff. Uh, I put a comment in that minimum speeds for fans and pumps should be based on the fan or pump uh, curve for that manufacturer. What I have seen in the past is um, people just ar arbitrarily set the BFD for some low speed and it ends up running a fan or a pump in the unstable region of, of its performance curve. So I would like to have just a little caveat or a note uh, inserted there saying that, you know, 10% is fine as long as it doesn't violate the manufacturer's uh, performance curves. That's all I had for that page. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Dave, Dave says ditto. Okay, page uh, 21. Page 21. Um, in, in the middle, paragraph 13, it mentions uh, alarms, and it gives five different levels of alarms. Um, I'd like to have something added that if an alarm is overrided by the user or a VAS operator, that it should uh, and somehow record the BAS operator's um, his identification or, or who did the change, and then maybe um, put a note in as to why. Because again, in my experience uh, with uh, with Chrysler, I've seen too many overrides, software overrides go in place or BAS overrides go in place. Nobody knew who did it, why it was done, and it was with some investigation. It was determined it was supposed to be a weekend change or something and, and we find it six months later. So and, okay. and I also 
I also think that you know by putting an, an ID or recording the operator, it would make them a little more cognizant of um, what they're doing before they do something. Makes sense. Now, I've heard some talk around here about the length and duration, or the, at least the duration and the, uh, I guess the uh, perceivability, the perception and the duration of the alarm signal. Uh, have you heard anything like that from Scott, Dave? Oh um, no, I haven't actually. No. Okay. Scott um, wanted to put something in about that. Uh, so the signal. Duration, the alarm signal duration. There's enough of a, a, a agreement on how long that should last. You know, I, I'm. I well, it certainly it's lasts as long as it's in alarm, but there, uh, if it's an override, you're talking about maybe an override that could expire. And that's the whether the controls contractors can make that feature available or not. That would be a desirable feature, uh, but I don't know if they have that feature available. We have, uh, in, in my past life, we've talked about putting the overrides in, and then in order to have the override take place, you had to put in a designated time. Um, the concern there is is just having a general eight-hour limit on the override um, might not work when we are in a construction mode on that system or something, and we need maybe two or three months of override. So. Yeah, we generally what we do is we record who made the change, what time it was. We also have a place for them to make a record. It's not within the BAS system, though. Uh, okay. Generally, there is uh, a place where they go. We use a thing called e-log, and we put in who made the change and why they made the change, who requested the change, what the expected duration is, and then if there's a question later. Uh, we can see that what happened, but there's nothing that gives us the timer that allows us to see an automatic expiration. And say, hey, this thing should not long, no longer be overridden, um, and bring it back in front of you to have that checked. It's, okay. Some things could stay and override longer than desired, and that's part of what we look at a continuous commissioning type uh, process to identify and help with. Yep, and that's what we ran into um, my previous job as well, is that uh, overrides were being used too frequently, not being undone um, frequently enough, and and we'd find, case in point, we had an alarm on a, uh, they had like uh, close to 100 sump pumps, and they were a duplex type sump pump arrangement and when one pump went into alarm there was a standby and you'd get the alarm. BAS would silence it, nothing would get done, and then the second pump would fail, go in alarm and then, you know, a few minutes later or a few hours later you'd have a flood. And you'd go back and find, oh yeah, that went into alarm uh, six months ago or a year and a half ago and Yeah, we've had at least I've also had some experience with this, though. Some years ago, we were doing a routine maintenance over the Ingalls building, and um, there was an override of the HVAC system. And if you know, there's an animal research facility up there on the 11th floor, and it was not restored to normal. And we lost a lot of laboratory animals and about a decade's worth of the data. It wasn't pleasant in any way. So in any case, it's, it's, it's an area where we have to be careful, especially when we're doing ONM and we're taking, taking down for ONM or during construction. Okay. Let's see. Uh, I love war stories, but I guess we have to comment on this. So we're on page uh, 28 now. Far away there, Stuart. Okay. Looking at uh, paragraph 3.C, there's the uh, table there, and under um, VAV perimeter and, and interior, they give occupied temperatures. Um, I had uh, put a note in there that maybe 75 to 78, depending on what activities are taking place in, in the space. Um, and then over under unoccupied, it lists a, uh, a 90 degree set point for unoccupied times and cooling. I, uh, I question if that's a little bit, little bit too high. Um, maybe 85 or 88. You know, like a 10 degree setback would, would be better. 90 just seems to be a bit high in a, uh, well, depending on the space. I mean, if it's a warehouse or mechanical space, 90 might not be. But uh, an 
an office space, a 90, I, I felt was a little bit too high. And then there's a the question of if you set it back that high, you know, 16 degrees, how fast can the system catch up? And then, then there's the question of, you know, if it takes you an hour or two to set up, now you've got to adjust your start time appropriately to, to take into account that startup time. So that's I think there are regional considerations with this as well. So we could be looking at, you know, if you're down in Florida or Texas or some warmer climate, those numbers may very well be different than a northern climate set of... It, uh, uh, so the, I don't know that we can set a, a standard like this for all all states. And well, maybe maybe put in then uh, you know how ASHRAE has everything has the country divided into regional climate zones. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe modify this chart to take that that climate zone into account then, and then then adjust the numbers accordingly. Yeah, I agree. That that would be a lot more. Uh, a lot more reasonable. Okay. okay, good. I think ASHRAE has got to divide it up by the county, if I'm not mistaken. So, all right, we'll move on to page 33. Go ahead. Go ahead, Stuart. Okay, page 33, um, paragraph C.2.B.1, point point where it lists um, the zone groups. It puts computer rooms, network closets, mechanical and electrical rooms all in the same zone. And, um, my thought is that the temperature, to me, a uh, computer room and networking closet, uh, the climate or the temperature is more sensitive than it would be in, in most mechanical and electrical rooms. And maybe those two spaces should be put into their own separate zone group. I know for mechanical equipment, you know, we'll let, in many cases, uh, mechanical rooms, you know, don't even get uh, cooling. Because of the heat. Yeah, I agree. You can definitely have different uh, set points for those areas as well, so, and expectations. Okay. Page 69. That one uh, was um, down in paragraph D, point one. There's some, they list a, a CO2 concentration of, of a, uh, that the, uh, the loop should maintain 1,000 parts per million. That seems really high. I've, I've done a little bit of work with this in a previous job. And according to um, Industrial Ventilation book, page 8.4, once you get above 600 parts per million, you start to get uh, some complaints. When you get above 800 parts per million, the uh, complaints become more numerous. And at 1,000, it's considered uh, to be insufficient, an insufficient condition by their terminology. And I know when I've done, I've actually had, a, had to go around with a CO2 meter and, and measure certain spaces where, where we had uh, complaints. And uh, what I found that, like in, in this area of Michigan, the outdoor air CO2 levels were between three and 400 parts per million. When I had indoor CO2 levels, say above 8 or closer to 9 or 950, I was getting a lot of complaints, headaches, um, sick leave, you know, having, having to go home and stuff. So I just question if the, if the 1,000 is too high as a, uh, as a set point or something to maintain. Um, but what makes it difficult to figure out is like if you have a 400 parts per million of out, uh, outside air to begin with, in order to keep it, you know, in that seven or eight hundred parts per million range, might require more outside air, depending on what what your occupants are doing. You know, I think on this one, it might be a semantics thing here. Instead of saying shall maintain CO2 concentration, maybe it should be uh, shall uh, limit CO2 concentrations or control below a thousand parts per minute. So in other yep. words. At 1,000 parts per minute, you're at 100% open on your dampers. At 800, they're saying that you start opening the dampers at 800, and so you're going to fall somewhere in between the two. But it kind of sounds like you're shooting for 1,000, and you really that's not what we're what they're trying to do, I wouldn't think, here. So that's, you may want to word that to say something like, uh, shall not keep it from exceeding 1,000 parts per minute. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. That that maintain is what got me. Yeah. Because what it what it told me is that that's the that's the average level you want to keep, and you really want it, you know, six or eight hundred. Yeah, it's going to start overriding at eight hundred and keep it trying to keep it below. Nine, our typical target is around nine hundred as a as a what we try to keep as a maximum, but nine or nine fifty. Okay. That's all right. Go ahead for that that page. We're on page 94. Now. 94. So this one, I, I question throughout this page and I think next couple pages after. They talk about every five minutes having the EMCS calculate the uncorrected outdoor air intake volume. The concern I have is, is that too many times in an hour? Can our system uh, record uh, the level, make the calculation, send the signals to the proper control devices, have them start modulating, and get a response to, and, and get a, a good response to that condition in that five minutes, or are we going to have it constantly changing, kind of a hunting condition? Yeah, and that gets into the data flow issue, too, depending on how fast the networks are. Um, in, in new systems, they may be different than from legacy systems. Okay. So, well, I'm, uh, I guess I, I agree that um, prescribing five minutes may not be the the best uh, the best if time. Think, it needs to be optimized based on uh, data throughput or the, the system capabilities. And in the uh, the stroke time for dampers and valves and stuff. I mean, if it takes a minute for a, a damper to complete its stroke, and then another minute for a for a valve or something else, you know, you could be, and then another couple of minutes for the condition to, uh, to adjust in, in the space. You know, I I just felt five minutes, you're going to be doing a lot of hunting. The dampers are going to be constant in constant motion in the valves. And it strikes me that four times an hour is sufficient. Yeah. And like I, I thought five minutes was too soon, but then, in honesty, I can't tell you what is the best time. And I, I kind of like what you threw out there is, you know, four times an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, also, what consideration do we make for fire compartmentalization? Very often there are duct detectors in these systems, are there not? There could be on air hand, like smoke detectors, um, CO2 sensors, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, all right, fair enough. I think you've repeated this comment throughout here. Yeah, 90, 90. Yep, next page I said the same thing, 96. And if we go to uh, page 97, there's the... 97 uh, is uh, it's a different, uh, a different concept. Uh, go ahead on 97. Okay, 97 under the economizer lockout, it lists um, under fixed dry bulb that the economizer lockout would happen at an outdoor temperature of 75. Um, depending on, on the um, climate zone, it just seems to me that if we want to do some kind of cooling in the building with the economizer, um, if we lock out the economizer at close to 70 or 75, if we want a 10 or 15 degree rise in the room, if I if I dump if I take outdoor air at 70 degrees, use it for cooling in the room, I'm going to have great difficulty keeping that room any colder than 75 or 80. Based on 70 going in, I have to have a temperature rise to remove heat from the room. So that was that was my concern. Okay, Dave agrees. Usually, Usually I've seen economizers lock out at like 55 degrees or based on an enthalpy, 55 and or enthalpy. Okay, page 100. Um, this one, this was the, uh, down in paragraph 10, freeze protection. It lists, I like the idea, well, I think it's, it's 42 degrees where you start, I thought for it to lock out the 
the dampers and maintain 42 degrees, we could be sending air too cold to the spaces. And then it says that the function disables the function when the supply temperature rises above 45. So that's, that's telling me that I could, in, in certain conditions, get supply air temperature between 42 and 45. And I just thought that that disabling point or that enabling point should be closer to 50 to 55 so that we get kind of um, room, normal room supply temperature. Any discussion on that one, Dave? Yeah, we typically don't send boiler room requests automatically, um, so it's a kind of a different scenario. It's not something we typically do. Okay. Um, but our freeze protection certainly, uh, we want to, you know, maintain temperatures. There was a another location where I was going to have a comment anyway, and that was about what the what the uh, valve positions become when the fan is turned off and and on, on first startup and so forth. And up in the northern climates, we like to start out with a, a heating mode. When the fan's down, we like to maintain a temperature in the mixed air plenum um, so the heating coil can turn on or off without airflow as needed to keep the plenum above, you know, at, at basically mixed air set point and keep it from uh, tripping the freeze stat, because it looked like when those valves went closed, they would allow the temperature to get low enough to trip the freeze stat, and when you turn on the fan, then the fan wouldn't actually start. So um, there are other considerations along with this, too. Okay. I, I was just looking at the 42 to 45, and I thought that was a bit too low um, to, main, to maintain. En enable at 42 might be okay. Disable at 45, saying that I could have a condition where I'm I have supplier between 42 and 45. I just thought we could create a condition where we're supplying too cold of air to a row. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We never want our discharges to be that low here. Uh, okay. We want that. Okay. Page so, uh, 106. 106. Um, down at the bottom under the fault code number five under uh, description. I'm wondering if that's a typo where it says supplier temperature too low should be higher than mixed air. Now I could see that in a in a heating situation your supplier temperature would be greater than your mixed air. But I guess either I'm misreading something or my supplier should always be colder than my mixed air. Or is this or is this saying that that's a fault that you would see? Well, you start doing tabular material with uh, unusual characters, it increases the likelihood of it being a typo. Okay. I just wondered if, yeah, because supplier for cooling should be colder than the mixed air. And I don't, I don't know. That's why I'm saying in that fault code number five, if they're saying that that is the fault that they're seeing is that supplier temperature is higher than, but then it says supplier should be higher than mixed air. And again, like we talked last week, I think I think it's just a typo. Yeah, that, that has to be for a winter mode operation, I would think, because um, certainly when it's summertime, you don't want the, the mixed air could be whatever, 75 degrees. And so... And maybe um, that could be, uh, maybe that should you be You definitely want the supplier lower than the mixed air in summer mode operations, so. Yeah. Uh, maybe they should put some. It says cooling coil valve leaking or stuck open. That presumes you have cooling available in the wintertime, which we do in some cases. And um, if it's wintertime operation and the supplier temperature is below the mixed air temperature, that would indicate a, a possible problem with heating or the cooling coil. That, that makes sense. So I would say, okay. yeah, in winter mode, uh, this could apply. Okay. It, maybe it just say this only applies when the mixed air or when the outside temperature is below 55 degrees or 50 degrees or whatever. That's why I was wondering if they should maybe put a qualifier in there that, that this is cooling or heating mode of operation. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We're on the last page. One, 121. Yeah. Again, that, that's just a general comment. 
to refer back to that page 97, which talks about the, the uh, economizer lockout temperatures. Okay. So that's just a repeat. And then okay. 123 is just a repeat of, again, of what we talked about earlier, that 42 to 45 degree um, freeze protection zone. Okay. That's well, I have. Uh, any, any closing comments here, Dave? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I have a couple other things uh, that I'll be putting in for this uh, related to, uh, there's in the point uh, section that talks about having an outside air temp sensor on every unit. That's not something that we intend to do or would want to do. Um, I can see where in some coastal regions where just from one building to a, another, there could be a, a substantial difference in temperature based on, you know, fog rolling in or whatever. But um, so I can see where in some places you need to have a lot more outside air sensors. But in our case, uh, we, we don't. And we don't see a high variability in the outside air temperature from different parts of our campus, enough to uh, warrant the expense of putting these in in all of those locations. And also, the other one was where it talks about the when you start the loop, uh, control loop, uh, the default start position is in the all the valves closed. And for us, that's not the case. We want to default to heating mode so that we don't trip the unit out on free stat in the wintertime. So again, that's more of a regional climate type expectation. And, uh, well, maybe, so that's it. maybe they can, again, kind of clarify that you know, by region or something like that. OK, well, I'll get that keyed in there for you. Well, uh, thanks very much for your time, Stuart. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for, for at least listening to me. Yes. No, you spent a fair Those that are still listening after this long of a time, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, if we can take anything, I suppose I could go back to the, um, if I, I use the example, what do we have here back in? I think our viewers Thanks very see. much, Dave. And Kim. We've had 153 views on some of the technical specifics regarding building automation. I believe this is the uh, temperature sensor. So there are people out there who are interested in this topic. And I hope is that uh, this adds a little color and dimension to the comments we'll be placing in front of the ASHRAE 36P committee. Uh, we're, we're, we've done some things here with the audio that might be a bit of a challenge. Fortunately, I have somebody in Los Angeles who's pretty good at cleaning up what might be some feedback. So I'm going to keep this at a half an hour. And I'm grateful for your time, Stuart. And I'll come down to your office uh, before the end of the day, and we can uh, follow up on this. Oh, okay. Dave has one more thought. Well, yeah, one follow-up thing is I, I express support for the whole idea of coming up with alarm limits and so forth and trying to set some standards because it has been something we've looked at over the years, and it's hard to reach consensus on what those limits should be. So this is, uh, this is great from that perspective. Good. Thanks, Stuart. I'll see you. Uh, this will be on YouTube uh, within the hour, okay? okay Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sure,